Well, we're exploring this precious little book called Amos. We're in the second session, and we'll explore chapters 2, 3, and 4 if we can make our timing tonight. And so, just by way of perspective, you know that when uh, Solomon died, the, there was a civil war, and the nation of Israel divided into two houses that called themselves Judah and Israel. And not to confuse the house of Israel with the total nation of Israel, we tend to use the terms the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. Many people believe the southern kingdom are only two tribes. That's not quite correct. We'll touch about that as we go. Certainly it was dominated by the tribe of Judah, but there were others with them. And uh, they often speak of Israel as the ten tribes that got lost somehow. And that's nonsense and we'll deal with that. But clearly the two, the two houses um, split up. They, they were from time to time at war with each other. Or we're going to be dealing with a period when they both were prospering, interestingly enough. And uh, to make the chart a little clearer, I'm going to focus on the part that Second Kings covers, namely the bottom half of that chart. So we'll expand that so we can talk about it a little bit. And uh, we know that the northern kingdom went from bad to worse and ultimately was taken over by Assyria. And uh, the uh, southern kingdom... Uh, also went bad, and it was uh, 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 taken over uh, by Babylon. And uh, we're going to deal with Nineveh as one of the cities of the Assyrian captivity, uh, uh, before the Assyrian captivity, because um, the, the, the whole thing falls to Babylon. So the captives from that get commingled in the Babylonian captivity. We'll talk about that as we go. Following the Babylonian captivity of the southern kingdom, um, we call that the post-exile period. We have under Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, an era that's called the post-exile period. Now, Elisha, Elijah and Elisha were uh, uh, prophets to the northern kingdom. And we're at the tail end of Elisha's ministry here. Uh, most of us are familiar with the major prophets of the Bible, and uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And uh, these four are called major because they're just larger books. They're not more significant. And Isaiah... And, and uh, they, they, each reign, they each prophesied in a reign of a series of kings. And when you study those uh, books of prophecy, you should also understand the, uh, the uh, history they fall within to. Uh, Ezekiel, is, uh, Daniel is deported into Babylon when the Babylonian captivity starts. In the second deportation, Ezekiel joins him there. Jeremiah is all the time prophesying from Jerusalem during that whole period. And after that captivity, well, it's, that's enough of the majors. What we're really focusing on to get, all this is just to get some perspective, are 12 small books called the Minor Prophets. They're not less important, they're just smaller books. And there's 12 of them. And they are in a particular order in your Bible that I, I'm, I can't imagine how they got in that order. But that's the order we have them in our Bible, and that's fine. But Hosea is the first in your list, and he... Uh, is going to, he, he talks about the same period of time that Amos will talk about here shortly. Joel is earlier than either one of those, and he's a prophet to the southern kingdom, the time of Amaziah and so forth. Amos, the one we're going to be focusing on tonight, is cotemporaneous with Hosea, and he's a, he is from the southern kingdom, a businessman from the southern kingdom, but uh, called by God to take a message, a very unpopular message, to the northern kingdom. Um, Obadiah speaks to the Edomites. Um, Jonah, as you know, speaks to Nineveh. A Gentile, he's a prophet to the Gentiles, interestingly enough. And uh, uh, then we have Micah as a southern kingdom. But then we have Nahum, who actually, uh, Jonah gets them to, in Jonah's thing, they repent. So they get another century. When Nahum goes for the, in the same situation, sort of, uh, they don't repent. And that's when Assyria falls. And they fall to a city that's grown to be powerful, namely Babylon, Started the Babylonian Empire. The captives from the Assyrians com are commingled with the captives from Babylon, and many people overlook that as they build their conjectures. But uh, Habakkuk and Zephaniah are more of the southern kingdom guys, if you will. Then you get to the post exile period where you've got three of these Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi that are post exile. And um, there's that leads you to the period between the Old and New Testament. Some people call that the silent years. Uh, and, uh, but they're not silent at all. They're in your Bible if you know where to look. Daniel chapter 11, 5 through 35 details those years so precisely that critics have said it couldn't have been written by Daniel back then. It had to be written after the fact, which is nonsense because most of it deals with things that occurred 
after it was translated into Greek. So that's another whole thing. Chronologically, before the exile, we, the, we have them in this order, Abadiah, Jonah. This is using Usher's dates as a guide here. Obadiah, Jonah, Joel, Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, and Micah. And then Nahum and Zephaniah. So, uh, and Habakkuk. So the, that's the list from a chronological point of view. Um, Amos, of course, is about 787 B.C. and it's a prophet to the northern kingdom. So um, he, by this reckoning, would be slightly ahead or it's certainly contemporaneous with Hosea. And after the exile, of course, we have the usual three uh, uh, during the exile and three after the exile, straightforward enough. Now, what I'm going to suggest, to, maybe this will help raise the understanding or maybe add to the confusion, I'm going to suggest these in a slightly different order. And I'm going to take the prophets to the northern kingdom first. That's Hosea and Amos. And, of course, it's Amos that we're dealing with here tonight. Obadiah is a book written to the, against the Edomites. And we have Jonah and Amos. Those three are to Gentile targets, if you will. Joel, Micah, and Sephaniah, and Habakkuk are prophets to the southern kingdom. And then you have the post-exile prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. That's the way I think it makes it understandable to me because you got them really by subject matter that way, pretty much. And so... Uh, for what that's worth. But anyway, that's where Amos fits into the total picture. And uh, let's talk a little bit about the times. Amos lived in times of material prosperity. There were very long reigns of the, the king in the south, Uzziah, and Jeroboam II in the north. They both reigned for a long period of time, ha enjoyed a very stable political environment, and uh, that brought prosperity and expansion to both kingdoms. So from their point of view, it's the best of all possible times. We often make reference to Charles Dickens' famous phrase that opens his tale of two cities. It was the best of times and it was the worst of times. It was the best of times to the people. They thought it was the best of times. From God's point of view, it was the worst of all possible times. And that's the burden that, a a uh, that Amos is going to deal with. The southern kingdom, calling itself Judah, had subdued the Philistines to the west, the Ammonites to the east, and the Arab states to the south. So Uzziah's political influence was fell as far as Egypt, and it becomes a stabilizing southern protector of the northern kingdom. Okay? The northern kingdom, to whom Amos' message is directed, was at the zenith of its power. And uh, Aram, that's Syria, had not recovered from her defeat in 802 BC by Assyria. And, uh, and Assyria, however, had been unable to press her advantage because she had her own distractions. So that, so that sort of stabilized the north for the northern kingdom. A succession of inept rulers and troublesome irritarians to the north kept Assyria preoccupied until the accession of Tiglath-Pileser III in 745 B.C. So, so the northern kingdom enjoyed political stability. A standard army had extended its borders all the way to Damascus, actually. And uh, so given a free hand, Jeroboam II was able to extend its borders to the Aramean. When you say, remember, Aram was the ancient name for what we think of today as Syria, okay? And he reclaimed Israel's lands east of the Jordan. So they're doing very well. And because of the control this gave Israel over the trade routes, wealth began to accumulate in her cities. Everybody's doing well. Okay? Commerce thrived. An upper class emerged. Expensive homes were built. Many people had a summer and winter home, that kind of thing. The rich enjoyed indolent, indulgent lifestyle. By the way, does this sound like any place you know about today? Okay. The poor became targets for legal and economic exploitation. The poor is the ancient term for what we call today the voter. Okay. <laughs> Slavery for debt was easily accepted. Standards of morality had sunk to a low ebb. And that's always your primary concern. Idolatry. Jeroboam I, that back you know, 150 years earlier, had instituted idol worship with two golden calves, one at Dan and one at Bethel. They were replicas, so to speak, of Aaron's golden calf 700 years earlier that led to the, you know, Ten Commandments and all that. You've all seen that movie, if nothing else. So religion flourished. Underscore religion flourished. The people thronged to the shrines for the yearly festivals, enthusiastically offering their sacrifices. Their sacrifices, in their mind, wasn't opposed to these legitimate sacrifices down in Jerusalem. 
they were just supplemented by these other things. They didn't really appreciate that they are rebuttals to the ones down there. Okay? They steadfastly maintained that their God was with them and considered themselves immune to disaster because they're religious and they were they attended all the rituals and so forth very enthusiastically it would seem but they did not welcome this uninvited prophet from the south Amos his message was that Israel that's the northern kingdom was experiencing mercy before the storm things look great guys but God is upset is his message really and his message is one of God's impending judgment now it's up to you as we go forward you're going to be probably very surprised to perceive the incredible parallel between both the predicament and the reactions to that predicament that we see today and if that's the case we want to look very carefully at what God's remedy was for that predicament so you need to decide if there is a parallelism with us and if so what that implies for us you're going to find that this ancient book has an amazing startling uh, parallel to our lives today so we outlined last time we took the introduction to Amos of course and he then plunges into eight judgments and we went through those a judgment on Damascus a judgment on Gaza the, on Philistia judgment on Tyre or Phoenicia if you will judgment on Edom a judgment on Ammon or what we think of as northern Jordan judgment on Moab what we think of as central Jordan judgment on Judah oh that's the southern kingdom here and then the judgment on Israel now these eight judgments are very very strategic because what Amos is doing is describing the judgments on all those other guys you see these first handful here this first what five are the heathen nations that surrounded them then he picks on Judah that's that southern place that he comes from but that's those guys down there that's all just setting the stage climaxing on his real target which of course is Israel the northern kingdom so God's going to also judge the southern kingdom what would for what would he judge the southern kingdom for because they did not keep the commandments of God they despised God's law they had the law of God and despised it that was his message to the to, to, to Judah if you will if you may recall from last time have you noticed that God did not judge any of these other nations on that basis whatsoever in the first five he judges this Gentile nations but not for not keeping his law that was given to Judah and Israel they had plenty of other things that God judged them for he judged them for certain specific sins which were common to natural man he didn't burden them with the fact that they were also breaking God's laws because he, he, uh, he didn't have to go that far he just they were doing the basic things that they knew better because these nations did not have God's law they were not judged according to God's law that's a contrast we're going to see with both Judah and Israel so of these eight judgments um, in the first few verses of chapter 2 we took last time focusing on the judgment on Judah lightly but now Amos turns to his primary assignment by God Israel Israel in the sense of the northern kingdom Israel here used as the house of Israel okay what's going to confuse you as we go sometimes God will enlarge his discussion with the whole house of Jacob meaning both north and southern kingdoms that confuses some of, some of the commentators it's amazing to me how many commentators don't really recognize that Amos's primary thrust is against the northern kingdom all this other is sort of uh, uh, extra so to speak well last time we went through these eight places but we're down to Israel itself which is up in the region obviously north of Judah and on the coast there so that's straightforward you can guarantee that the map will be on the final exam when you get there should you be in that mode so you'll you want to do some homework there 
So we're, we've done verses 2, 3, 4, and 5 last time, chapter 2. Let's jump in where we left off. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they sold the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of shoes. This pattern is a Hebraism. I'll give you three reasons, no four. It's, a, it's, just, a, it's just a rhetorical way of emphasis. And uh, so it's just, it, you'll see that occur again and again, not just in Amos, but in the book of Proverbs and some of the Psalms and so on. The, the, they call it the X, uh, X plus one formula. Not just X, but X plus one. Not, only, not just three, but four. Okay? There's six things God hates, no seven. See, that, that typical uh, uh, Hebraism. Okay. Now, um, he sold the righteous for silver. The word tzadikim in the Greek, Sadducees in the Greek, uh, tzadikim in the Hebrew, uh, Sadducees in the Greek, the righteous ones. What were they doing? They were bribing judges and slaving them for debt and so forth. And that was prohibited all through the Old Testament. We won't track that down ourselves. I'll leave that to you when you go through your notes. Every class of sin is going to be involved here. Theological errors in chapter 3, cruelty in chapter 1, breaking moral law in chapter 2, social evils oppressing the poor in chapter 2, and so forth. That pant after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor and turn aside the way of the meek. And a man and his father will go into the same maid to profane my holy name. Wow. The word panther is to sniff the ground like an animal in chase of prey is the actual verb. It's, it's as if the wicked in pursuit of helpless victims, that even after the dust of the earth, to, uh, to put dust on the head of the poor. It, it's, a, it's a rhetorical way of saying the unrelenting cruelty toward the poor. And turn aside the way of me. Then we have this other thing, the son and the father are taking the same uh, slave girl. Many commentators presume it's a prostitute, um, probably, and yet she just may be a, a servant slave that's being abused. But in any case, this is not an isolated case, but open immorality, violating the, the rights for the gratification of forbidden lusts is what's involved. And Exodus 21 deals with that. It doesn't take any insight to realize that that offends God. In, 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 a, in a very special dimension. The rights of all legal redress before God is what's, what is the, the, the flavor here that is dealt with in Deuteronomy 10, among other places. But it may, makes something else in here. Not only is it offensive, but it seems to be in order to profane my holy name. In other words, it's being done in an, almost as an act of rebellion against God that comes out of the preposition that it implies an express purpose and intention to profane God. So the Hebrew is evil, actually more intense than the English translation, if you will. And they lay themselves down upon clothes laid to pledge by every altar, and they drink the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. Now, first of all, they're doing this, the house of their God. He's referring to the altars that have been set up at Bethel and Dan to these golden calves. And they're using those altars to sanction the oppression of the poor. How are they doing that? There is a mosaic prohibition against taking a pledge from a guy if it's his coat after the sun goes down. If he takes a pledge to guarantee some action, you're not allowed in the mosaic law to keep that overnight because that's all he has to keep himself warm. It's a form of, of compassion that's in the law. So when they take clothes that are laid to pledge and they don't, they use them themselves and don't return them overnight, that's a violation of the mosaic law. It may sound technical, but that's a, that's a mosaic issue that's, that's alluded to in this first thing. And, the, and then the other one is this, uh, it's interesting that God had to go to another, another nation, namely go south to Tekoa to find Amos, to find a righteous man to rebuke them. The inference that many commentators make, one reason Amos was picked for this assignment is that God didn't have someone local to do it. Well, he did. One, he had Hosea. But the point is, he had to go, he had to reach uh, to the south to get his messenger, interestingly enough. And uh, punitive damages from all this stuff should have gone to the victims of restitution, not to the jurists. What's going on here is that the reason these abuses are taking place is because the judges that are supposed to prevent them are taking bribes. That's going to come out here as we go. Okay. God speaking says, Yet destroyed I the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars. And he was strong as the oaks, and yet I destroyed his fruit from above and his roots from beneath. 
No, it's God's taking credit for having given them their successes in the past. Despite the fact that he gave them their successes in the past, they are rebelling against the God that provided them those victories. So, uh, I destroyed the Amorite before them. Now, that's a term that's used two ways. It is used denotatively for a specific Canaanite tribe. We see that in Jericho, which was their capital. Rahab the harlot was an Amorite. Amorites were a definitive tribe. But it's also, as it so often happens, that term can be used connotatively to, to signify their enemies in general. I'll give you some other examples. The northern kingdom consisted of the geography of about ten different tribes, but Ephraim was the biggest, largest one. So often in the Bible it will speak of Ephraim as a synecdoche, that is a, a, an idiom for the whole package. A synecdoche is when you pick the specific for the general or use the general for the specific. It's a rhetorical device. In other words, you can use it connotatively. And uh, so, um, uh, so the word Amorite is used both ways. In Genesis 10 and Exodus 3, it's used denotatively. In Genesis 15 and Joshua 24, it's used connotatively. Uh, so it could be used either way here. It still fits. And an example of that is the spies report in Numbers 13 when they see the Nephilim in the land and all of that. You can check that out on your own. But uh, this is the flavor of what God is saying here implies supreme ingratitude. Because he destroyed their enemies that were so large and so terrifying. And he intervened to give them these victories. And what do they reward him with? See, he, he destroyed the Amorite armies. That's, that's celebrated in this verse 9 here. He's going to talk in the next verse about the deliverance from Egyptian slavery. The provision in, uh, when they wandered in the wilderness for 38 years, he provided for them. And then he brought them into the promised land. And then uh, he manifested his presence and guidance as no other nation has ever experienced. And that's going to summarize in verse 7. So verses 9, 10, 11 are going to celebrate these things that he did for them that they're, uh, uh, in effect, uh, demonstrating in, in unbelievable ingratitude. So he continues here in verse 10. I also brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you 40 years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. And I raised up your sons for prophets and of your young men for Nazarites. Is it not even thus, O ye children of Israel, saith the Lord? I raised them up. In other words, he called them. He raised up prophets by his initiative, God's initiative, to woo them back into the, into the covenant relationship. What did they do in response? But ye gave the Nazarites wine to drink and commanded the prophets, saying, Prophesy or not. Now what was a Nazarite? You need to understand what a Nazarite was. A Nazarite was somebody who voluntarily took on a vow for a period of time, to do three things. He let his hair grow long, and the reason he did is because that was considered a sign of shame for a man. And that's not a question of Paul's judgment, that's what the intention was, that the long hair was a, a, a sign of, uh, of humility or, or shame. And Paul, Paul emphasized that for you. The second thing is they were not allowed to touch any grape products. Not just wine, but raisins or grapes, they, that was prohibited. The third thing is they could not touch anything dead. That's what a Nazarite did. If, not, if a friend, if the best friend died, they didn't go to the funeral. That was a Nazarite. And they were, that was just their way of separating themselves and setting themselves up as an example of commitment to the God of the covenant, the Nazarites. So the background is number six for those that want to check it out. Examples in the scripture are Samson was a Nazarite, very more familiar to most of you maybe. Samuel was a Nazarite. And... Uh, uh, you may say, gee, that's a quaint practice in ancient Israel. No, liberal preachers do the same thing today that they did. These guys separated themselves as an example and then were corrupted by the locals by giving them wine or cutting their hair or whatever, violating their covenant. Unbelieving liberals do the same thing by defiling the preachers. When there's a preacher of the gospel of Christ in a pulpit, not preaching the gospel of Christ, he's watering down the message, doing the same thing that compromised the Nazarites are. As a result, the message was confused, and uh, the command is to be silent. Now, Amos experienced this, experienced this very thing when we get to chapter 7, we'll talk more about that. And that's why there will be a famine not of food or wheat or whatever, of the Word of God. You and I can't imagine 
a famine of the Word of God. But you have it, in a sense, in effect, in America. The Word of God is more available today to the average person on the planet Earth than it ever has been on the planet Earth in the history of mankind. You can carry a half a dozen Bibles in your phone to read when you like. You can have the Greek or the, he the, Greek or the Hebrew translated for you on a computer and that's free of charge. I mean, we'd go on and on and on. And yet, the biblical illiteracy in the pulpits today is probably the worst in our history. In the revolutionary days, the average person on the street knew something about their Bible. It's astonishing to compare the literature of that period with the awareness today. Many of the pamphlets that were given out on the street, the Federalist Papers, are something you read in graduate school. Maybe not in college. College maybe, but certainly graduate school. I mean, it's amazing to understand that. The, anyway, let's move on. Amos continues, Behold, I am pressed under you as a cart is... God is speaking through Amos. Behold, I am pressed under you as a cart is pressed that is full of sheaves. In other words, I am strained to the breaking point. That's just an agricultural way of saying I'm, I'm really stressed here. Strained to the breaking point. And lots of New Testament equivalents to that. So the next few verses are going to talk about Israel's, that judgment on Israel is certain. This is not problematic. This isn't a threat that might happen. No, no. This is coming. Don't confuse this with the John the Baptist kind of message. Unless you repent, this, that, and the other thing is going to happen. No, no. This is, this is certain. Defeats are going to replace victory. They're used to winning all their battles. Those days are over. See, in the past, the Lord fought on their behalf. And what's the remedy for all this? Remember the Christian's bar of soap, 1 John 1, 9. That's always available. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's His faithfulness we can count on, not our own. And that's always a remedy and still is today. But the final three verses are going to indicate that escape is going to be impossible. Amos chapter four, uh, 2, verse 14. Therefore, the flight shall perish from the swift. The strong shall not strengthen his force. Neither shall the mighty deliver himself. See, neither speed, bravery, or strength will save a man. Neither shall he stand that handleth the bow. And he that is swift of foot shall not deliver himself. Neither shall he that rideth the horse deliver himself. See, neither the weapons or the speed of retreat or even having a horse, will enable escape. And within 40 years, the Assyrians will take them into captivity is what actually happens. This is coming. It's not tomorrow, but it's coming within that generation. He that is courageous among the mighty shall flee away naked in that day, saith the Lord. The judgment on Judah was fulfilled in the 70 years captivity. The judgment on the northern kingdom was the worldwide dispersion which continued until May 14th of 1948. Because the northern kingdom evaporates from history. The people didn't. I'll come back to that later. Even the strongest nations, when they abandon God, fall swiftly and totally. The ingratitude of a uniquely blessed people causes pain and frustration. And that's, uh, that clearly is a parallel to where we are in America. Here we're uniquely blessed spiritually, uniquely blessed in many ways, and uh, certainly materially, and yet um, we're, we see a parallel here. There's no turning back the judgment of God after His repeated offers of grace and blessing are spurned and refused. And that's true today. That, that, that's true today. Well, with those eight judgments, we just finished talking about the judgment on Israel. It's the eighth of the eighth. So we're not, now Amos is going to turn and give three sermons on the judgment of the northern kingdom. This all was just a warm-up. He's not going to focus on Israel, but with three sermons. We're going to go at that. There's going to be, first sermon will be Israel's present, and that's in chapter 3. The second sermon will be Israel's past, that's chapter 4, a little short one. There will then be a third sermon, Israel's future. That's two chapters long, 5 and 6. Then we'll have five visions of judgment, and we won't go through all those here. And then that's chapter 7 and 8, and the first part of 9. And then we get to the Davidic kingdom restored. And it will shock you to discover how relevant 
a few verses of Amos are to the New Testament and to us today. That's where we're headed as we get the background here. Well, we're going to go into chapter 3 now, the first of these three sermons. We're focusing on Israel in the present. Verse 1, Hear this word that the Lord hath spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying... Did you notice that, by the way? Notice that? The whole family. This is not limited to just the northern kingdom. Most of what he says will be, in this case, though God is including the whole gang in this. This language yields a wider application than just the northern kingdom. Although the judgment will be initiated on the northern kingdom. He's speaking to the whole family of Israel which he brought out of Egypt. That includes the north and the south. In God's eyes, they're not two nations but one. The twelve tribes are one family before him. They were in two houses, yes, but they're one family. Let's never forget that. It's astonishing how much confusion is introduced by trying to regard them as two, fa two nations. No, they're one nation as far as God is concerned. And he emphasized that again and again in esch eschatological passages. The deliverance from Egypt is cited as the foundation of his relationship with Israel. It's amazing to me to go through the entire Bible and to see how again and again and again and again God always refers to the deliverance out of Egypt as a fundamental. Not just one of a series of miracles, a major fundamental thing. They went in as a family, came out as a nation. And he redeemed them. They belonged to him. Special privileges made them more responsible than their ignorant heathen neighbors. So he addresses the entire family. The key point there, their special privileges made them more responsible than their ignorant heathen neighbors. Apply that to America. Have we been specially blessed by God in this country over the last two centuries? I think so. Well, with that goes the responsibility that he's going to hold us accountable for as a group. Now, Israel was chosen. There's lots of verses on that. We don't have to beat that to death. Responsibility flows from relationship, and so does ours. We have been purchased by his blood. And that's talking not to us as Americans, us to as, as members of the body of Christ. We have a responsibility that goes far beyond what Israel had. Because he purchased us with his blood. The church is on the ground of substitutionary redemption. That's, a, a, a more, that's in, a, in, a, in a very real sense, more intense than anything you can imagine. That God himself became man and fulfilled it on our behalf, and he substituted himself for our guilt. Ooh, wow. We therefore owe him love and faithfulness. Boy, that's the understatement of, the, of our lifetime. No rules, no procedures, no. Just love and faithfulness. It's that simple. Trying to make it more complicated invites disaster. You only have I known, all, you, speaking to Israel, you only have I known of all the families of the earth, therefore I will punish you for all your iniquities. The word known there is yada. Yada, yada, yada. You'll have to hear that today. Well, you don't realize you're speaking, he speaking Hebrew when you say that. It means intimately acquainted, to choose to know. In international treaties, it means to recognize by covenant. To recognize by covenant. Therefore, See, because you have known, uh, because I've known you, therefore I will punish you for all your iniquities. That's the mystery of election. It's got two sides of that coin. See, only Israel was in fellowship and intimacy. Light creates responsibility. The more light you have, the more responsible you are. An enlightened nation has a greater responsibility than a nation that's in darkness. I want you to notice that Yoni Vavhe, and I, you can call him Yehovah or Yahweh, pick your way to pronounce the unpronounceable name, but in any case, his controversy with the Gentile cities which hated Israel was brief. When we went through those five heathen cities, each one was very brief. Because of this, I'm going to send fire. Period. That's simple. But here, Israel had been brought to the place of privilege so, and so of responsibility. So the Lord's indictment is going to be detailed and unsparing. Much more precise, much more detailed. That's, that, that's what you'll get. When you read the whole book, you'll get that flavor. The, the heathen are not, not forgiven. They're dealt with, but very peremptorily. Here, the, the situation is really detailed. God personally gave Israel the Ten Commandments. God appeared to their prophets. God spoke to Abraham and Moses. He dwelt in their tabernacle. And you're going to hear words equivalent to, remember the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7? Depart from me, I never knew you. 
You wonder, probably the most terrifying words in the Bible are verses 21 through 23 of Matthew 7. You chew on that one for a while. Anyway, Israel was not the only nation established by God, by the way. The Lord also brought up, that's the term used, the Cushites, the Philistines, the Arameans. So God brought up other nations. But there's only one that he had a covenant relationship with. That's Israel. Israel's uniqueness is due to his covenant relationship. And that's what he, they are going to be judged by. Their re all these other sins, yes, but especially that covenant relationship. Heavy stuff here. You might call this the election syndrome. Is that around today? Well, we're not Jewish. We don't have that problem. Wait a minute. The election syndrome is when a believer, or one who thinks he's a believer, begins to assume that what he or she does makes no difference. Since salvation is once and for all. And indeed it is. Justification is. Indeed. God will overlook disobedience is the, is the syndrome. Boy, is that widely embraced in the Christian community today by an overselling of grace, as if there's no flip side to that coin. The New Testament warns against this attitude in Romans 6, in Hebrews 6, in James 2. Check it out. My wife and I have published a book. Controver it's turned out to be very controversial, The Kingdom, Power, and Glory. And the reason it's controversial, it focuses on this very specific misunderstanding today. That all of us as Christians are going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Everyone before that judgment seat is saved. The judgment is what have you done with it? What fruit have you borne? It's a fruit bearing review. Ooh boy. You mean what we do today makes a difference? It certainly does. You mean I can lose my salvation? I don't think so. If you can lose your salvation, I've got a new name for God. It's called Butterfingers. Read John 10, verses 28 and 29 carefully, and dozens of other passages. No, if, you, if you've trusted Christ, you are saved. That doesn't, that's not the end of the story. What's your inheritance going to be? Is it going to be minimum or maximum? That depends on your fruit bearing. It makes a difference. One reason our book's doing so well in China is because the Chinese believe that they're in the, the kingdom of preparation, what we call the millennium, they call the kingdom of inheritance. And they believe their authority and responsibilities of the kingdom of inheritance will derive from their faithfulness today, and they're right on the mark. And they regard our, our book as a paraphrase of Dr. Tim's, uh, Dr. Timothy Lin's um, uh, teachings that they're so heavily uh, influenced by in China. Anyway, let's move on. God continues with Amos asking seven questions, by the way. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Good question. That may sound familiar to you because you remember that same remark when Abraham was taking Isaac up the hill for the Akedah, the offering of Isaac. They went in agreement. They, w w they walked together is the way your King James says. They actually said they went in agreement. How can they walk together except they agree, Amos says. Do they walk two together except they have made an agreement to meet? In agreement. The Greek term is koinonia in the New Testament. But we see that mod modeled, if you will, in uh, Genesis 22 which is also the passage, the first passage in the Bible where the word love appears. Interesting thing, check it out. He can no longer walk with Israel because they are no longer in agreement in where or even in which direction to walk. So these are rhetorical questions. He knows the answer. Who can, can two walk together except they be agreed? There's seven of these. They imply causality and certainty. Nothing by chance. The Lord has spoken His word. I suggest to you here, the Lord has spoken His frightening word. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Are you walking with God? Are you walking in agreement with Him? Well, I'm saved. Gee, I sure hope so. But are you walking with God? It's a different question. What kind of fruit are you bearing? How are you going to deal with the judgment seat? If you're not saved, you won't even be there. That's a whole different issue. If you're saved, you're going to be there. All of us are. How are we going to fare? Interesting question. Will a lion roar in the forest when he hath no prey? Will a young lion cry out of his den if he have taken nothing? Aria, the word there, is an adult lion. And there's a triumphant roar before he pounces on a prey. The, the young lion is a kafir, growls when his prey is already his. That's used in Isaiah 5 and Hosea 11 and other passages. And by the way, Israel's primary jet fighter is called a kafir. <laughs> young lion. Lions inhabited the land until about 80 A.D. when the Romans removed them for gladiatorial shows and persecution. 
culminating the dedication ceremonies of the Roman Colosseum in that year, in 80 AD. And uh, so much for that. Can a bird fall in a snare upon the earth where there is no gin or, or trap for him? Shall one take up a snare from the, the earth and have taken nothing at all? The trap, uh, the gin is a trap. Israel is already in his grasp for judgment. Shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in the city and the Lord hath not done it? See, he's saying Israel ought to be trembling and repent. You know, there's another, there's a, we've, we've got our vocabulary problems in this country. There is a word that used to be very prevalent in our vocabulary we never hear today called God fearing. The concept of electing a leader who's God fearing. Set aside doctrinal details, is he God fearing? Boy, does that cut through a lot of nonsense, right? So we don't use that anymore. We've added another word in our vocabulary instead. It's called trillion. And, and I can't find anyone that can tell me what a trillion is. But figure it out in seconds and you'll get my point. What I, what I'm, I, that's the only thing. I've got a dozen of these. The one that really works is this one. How much is a million seconds? Twelve days. How much is a billion seconds? Thirty-two years. Ooh. How much is a trillion seconds? 32,000 years. That's the relation between a million and a trillion is 12 days to 32,000 years. Did that get, you get, you, you, we've got congressmen uh, promoting bills they don't understand, they admit they don't understand, and congressmen signing bills they never read, and we wonder what's going on. Huh? Well, we also ought to tremble and repent. Shall there be evil in the city? The word there actually means calamity. Calamity. It's used all through the scripture, but so you don't, it's not evil in the sense of good and evil, it's calamity is what the term really means. And the calamity will, this calamity will be from the Lord himself that he's threatening here. Surely, now this is a, this is an incredible verse. It's one you may want to remember, memorize. Amos 3, 7. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. That verse, if you take it, what it says is a staggering verse. That there's nothing God's going to do that he hasn't explained to his prophets. Boy, is that an incentive to really know your Bible. Because everything God is up to is in there. Some of it very obvious, some of it perhaps more subtle, but it's all there. Let's take a look at this. He does nothing unless he reveals it. The word revealeth there is gala, which means to uncover or reveal. His secret is a Hebrew word means sod. It means secret counsel. It actually comes from a root that means couch or cushion. It's a secret told by whispering to another while sitting close together. You know the definition of a secret. That's something you tell one person at a time, right? <laughs> he reveals his secret unto his servants, not to everybody, to his servants. That's those that are inspired of God, not self-appointed. Second Peter 1 deals with that. And Jesus deals with that in John 14 and 17. Give you some examples of this. Noah in Genesis 6 through 9. Abraham in Genesis 18. Joseph. Each, in each one of these places, God reveals to them what he's doing secretly. Abraham in Genesis 18. Is Abraham not my friend? Shall I tell him what I'm going to do? He, that, that's chapter where he lets them in advance what's going to, go, what's going to happen. We had a very colorful negotiation going on at the end of that chapter. Joseph in Genesis 41, Samuel in 1 Samuel 3, Elisha, all through the scripture, he tips off him what's going on. So much so that the king of Syria thought he had a phone tap or something. And Jesus tells his believers about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, 38 years in advance. He says, that not one generation shall not pass till all this be fulfilled. He's talking to the generation that was to see the fall of Jerusalem 38 years later. 38 being a dis the duration of a, of a generation as defined in Deuteronomy 2. So, all the way through there. Many people who think that Luke 21 is part of the Olivet Discourse miss that because they, they lose the sharpness of what's really there. Anyway, the lion hath roared, who shall not fear? The Lord God hath spoken, who can but prophesy? against the area of the adult lion about to rush upon his prey. So we too must warn and declare, silence is not an option. 
See, that's the Lord God spoken. Who can but prophesy? Just as Amos is called to declare God's word, you and I are. When we fail to do that, we're failing what God has called us to do. Ooh. Now we're getting, now we're meddling in people's lives here a little bit. Comfortable up till now because of those guys. No, no, no. It's us guys. Publish in the palaces at Ashdod, in the palaces in the land of Egypt, and say, assemble yourselves upon the mountains of Samaria. That was the capital of the northern kingdom. Assemble yourselves about the mountains of Samaria, and behold the great tumults in the midst thereof, and the oppressed in the midst thereof. Great tumults. Who what? The disturbances. Wild living. He's saying the whole world is to take note. The same thing that he says in Revelation 18. Ashdod and Egypt are mentioned here. Well, always two witnesses are required. We know that. But those are kind of interesting ones. Ashdod, Ashdod and Egypt. It's possible that the scribes may have confused the Dalit and Aresh, which are very subtle Hebrew letters. Is it Ashdod or is it in Assyria? Either way, you can interpret it, but some scholars suspect that there may be also a textual issue here, a subtle one perhaps. In any case, they're used idiomatically in any case, so let's not make a thing of it. For they know not to do right, saith the Lord, who store up violence and robbery in their palaces. Rob violence and robbery in the palaces. I saw a cartoon recently. The son is going to the father and says, I think I'm going to take up a life of crime. The father says, in the public sector or the private sector? Hmm. <laughs> More leverage in the public sector, right? Now these are not just technical slips. Atsar means store up, heap up, pile up in a safe place. They no longer knew, yada again, what was right in the sight of God. What is right, that is to go straight. They had corrupted the message of God. The prophets to the northern kingdom were Elijah, Elisha, they both were looking, Jonah in a sense, although he was really targeted to Nineveh, Amos and Hosea, northern kingdom. Northern kingdom had a whole array of prophets here. The other point that's worth making, a person is not a horse thief because he steals a horse. He steals a horse because he's a horse thief. These people are sinners and they're going to be dealt with. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, an adversary there shall be even round about the land, and he shall bring down thy strength from thee, and thy palaces shall be spoiled. The invincible nation of Amos' time ceased within 40 years. It was invincible, prosperous, top of the heap, within one generation, it's gone. It is gone. The lion has roared. Who shall not fear? In 724 B.C., Shalmaneser V besieged Samaria for three years. King Hosea of Israel tempted to revolt against paying Assyrians an annual tribute money. He even tried to do a treaty with Egypt. Didn't help. Samaria fell in 722 B.C. Within one year, Sargon II seized power. The Assyrians pulled down the towers, took 27,290 captive, doesn't tell how many they killed, placed an Assyrian ruler over the city, they looted it of 50 royal chariots and other items and so forth. That's all in inscriptions that you can find in the publications if you want to dig into that. You hear about the lost 10 tribes. Let me just put a footnote here. So we put that one to bed. Okay, you've probably heard that. It's a myth that's very prevalent in literature. Sargon implemented, when he took over, his infamous policy of mixing conquered peoples to keep them from organizing a revolt. In other words, if he took a bunch of Jews, he would mix them with non-Jews. Why? So they wouldn't coagulate and form a revolt against him. That was a way of diluting their political, eth 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 geopolitical presence. Israel was mixed with Persians and others. Strangers from far off lands were resettled in Samaria. So the, the Jews were removed from Samaria, many of them, and non-Jews were moved in. That was commingling. That's what, they, that's what erases the, the presence of the, of the Jews there. Eventually, mixed semi-Jewish populations will result, a generation later, in what we call Samaritans. We all know the story of the Samaritans in the New Testament. They were a detested half-Jew that lived up in that region. Why were they half-Jews? Because they're the results of this commingling policy of the Assyrians when they conquered them. Follow me? When Babylon conquers the southern kingdom, it takes them as a group in captivity for 70 years, but they come back as a cogent group. Okay? Now, 
the so-called invincible nations cease to exist. But there's a, 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 a chapter, a, there's lots of, to this whole story, but let me just give you one reference to check out. Second Chronicles 11. Just remember Second Chronicles 11. What you'll discover there, Jeroboam I took the northern kingdom into idolatry, worshipping these golden calves. If you were a Levite in that region, that was an anathema. You, I, idolatry was the politically correct point of view. If you were faithful to temple worship and all that, which as a Levite you would be, what did you do? You picked up and migrated south where the politically correct mode was to worship at the temple. Right? Make sense? If you read the passage carefully, you'll realize that the Levites moved south. You can also infer from the text that others that wanted to be faithful to the temple left town. They moved to the extent they could to the south. The text doesn't say this, but you can also infer very comfortably that if you lived in the south and you had no use for the temple and all that, and you were attracted to idolatry, you wouldn't fight the city hall down there, you'd move up north where being an idolater was politically correct. You follow me? So what Second Chronicles 11 and other passages will highlight is there's a commingling of people. You follow me? There aren't ten lost tribes, members of those ten tribes, whatever they... First of all, there weren't ten, because we know the southern kingdom was Judah and Simeon and also Benjamin. That's three of, of uh, twelve. That means it sounds to me like you've got nine left, right? The Levites go south, that takes one more, so now you got four to the south, and if there's t s tribes lost, there'd be eight, right? Four from twelve is eight, not ten, right? But that's not the point. They're not lost, they're commingled. The faithful ones of all shapes and sizes are south. The idolaters of all shapes and sizes move north. They commingle. You with me? That's in the text. So this is a myth that was pro propagated years ago. It sometimes goes by the label of British Israelism. Uh, these guys were resettled presumably about 800 A.D. in Britain and northwestern Europe and Scandinavia and elsewhere. Denmark, Dan, Denmark was Denmark, all that business. The Old Testament promises that were to them devolve on Britain, America, and so forth. Jews become mixed with the Khazars, ancient people. These are all part of the myth. Manasseh ben Israel, back in 1604 to 1657, used these legends of lost tribes in pleading successfully for the admission of Jews into England during Cromwell's regime. That's where it got a lot of pot. It was used and became popular that reinforced this myth, this legend of the so-called lost tribes. There is no real evidence and the myth is not taken seriously by competent scholars. So for what it's worth, there's a, there's a whole study of this when we deal with the book of Joshua because at the end of the book we have the twelve tribes being allocated their land and all that and we use that occasion to put a whole hour into this whole issue if you want to get into it more. The key thing to be on your guard of, don't confuse the territories assigned to those tribes with the people themselves. See, I can be a Californian because I live in the region we call California. I can be an Ephraimite because I live in Ephraim. My tribe I might belong to might be Judah or some other tribe, but I happen to be living in Ephraim or I might be living in Asher. These tribal names describe geographic territories that were understood. That doesn't mean you're ethnically part of that tribe. And that's where the naive Bible student goes astray because, well, he's an Ephraimite, so he's, he's from the tribe of Ephraim. No, not necessarily. He lives in that tribal area. Because that all gets blurred as the years go by, obviously. Especially when there's got these north and south with different worship systems. That's going to have an influence. When you get to the New Testament, You've got books in the New Testament that are written to the twelve tribes. Book of James. It's actually Yaakov, by the way, but we call it the Book of James, is written to the twelve tribes. First and Second Peter are clearly addressed to the twelve tribes. So we, they, there's no lost tribes. Uh, Anna knew she was from the tribe of Asher and, and so forth. And, and, um, and Zechariah was of the tribe of, of uh, well, he's a, he was a Levite, but he was a tribe. But anyway, the point is, Simeon, the, these people knew what tribe they were from, and they're in the New Testament. They weren't lost. Okay? So let's move on here. Verse 12, Thus saith the Lord, as the shepherd taketh out of the mouth of the lion two legs, 
or a piece of an ear, so shall the children of Israel be taken out that dwell in Samaria, in the corner of a bed, and in Damascus in a couch. A lot of rhetorical stuff going on, pulled into pieces that means spread around Asia, Europe, and so forth. Evidence is required of a shepherd to prove that an animal had fallen prey to a wild beast is where the it, it's an agricultural idiom used by uh, Amos, who you realize was a business. He was not only a sheep herder, he was a farmer and a breeder. He's a, 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 a quite a successful businessman. So he's using agricultural business terms here. And uh, cover of a couch, fancy woven kilts, pillows are imported from Damascus. Uh, the word cover is Damask in Hebrew, by the way. So moving on. Hear ye, testify the house of Jacob, saith the Lord God, the God of hosts. Notice this verse, verse 13. Testify in the house of Jacob. The scope of this is more than just the northern kingdom. House of Jacob means all twelve tribes. No lost tribes here. And we have seven variants to, uh, to Adonai Yehovah El Hassel abroad. The Lord Yahweh, God of hosts. Or Yodhevave, just pronounce the letters as some rabbis do. Yodhevave, God of hosts. Yodhevave, the God of hosts, the Lord. Yodhevave, whose name is the God of hosts. And Lord Yodhevave of hosts. And uh, Yodhevave, your God. These are all phrases just here from the book of Amos. Seven variants of this title of the Almighty God, our Creator. <laughs> Moving on that in that day I will visit the transgressions of Israel upon him, I will also visit the altars of Bethel, and the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall into the altar is holy, but the, the altar of Bethel is, is a sacrilege. Bethel and Dan, Jeroboam, 150 years is the predecessor, Jeroboam the first, 150 years earlier had set up the golden calves there. Even with both Elijah and Elisha rebuking them, they still stood, shouldn't be. It took violence to get the two altars to come down. Remember Elijah killing the 450 priests of Baal, just all that? These things are still standing, despite all that. The horns, see the horns of the altar. Moses designated the altar as a piece of asylum, but not for sheltering a murderer in Exodus 21. His long suffering will expire. The altars of Bethel were clearly something God hated and from which His blessed presence was absent. 150 years later, it was Judah that didn't get the message until God spoke through Babylon. The United States, we used to be a bastion for freedom, for what, what, what is right, sending out missionaries and all that. That's what we used to do. And we passed our two century mark, just as they had. We're coming to the twilight years, perhaps. And I will smite the winter house with the summer house, and the houses of ivory shall perish, and the great houses shall have an end, saith the Lord. Winter and summer house of Herod, by the way, he had a summer palace at Masada. You'll visit there if you go to Israel, you want to go to some Masada, 1,450 feet high. The Israeli jet fighters have their altimeters set so they can fly below sea level. The only ones that do in the world, by the way. But uh, ivory plaques and fragments from the 8th century are, have been found in Samaria, and there's a lot of finds that cor corroborate all this. So, okay, uh, a quick snapshot of the second sermon, Israel's past, and we'll wrap this up. Samaria's failure to eat God's chastening is going to be he, uh, laid out here five times. The Lord recites his call to return to him. That seems to be the number of grace all through the Bible. God does not judge a nation without warnings. Are there perils with the United States? I think so. You feminists might want to notice something. I think it's kind of interesting. Chapter 3 was to the sons of Israel. And chapter 4 is to the women of Samaria. I wouldn't make a big thing of it, I just generate, uh, thought I'd generate some discussion in the discussion groups. By that, we'll move on. <laughs> Hear this word, ye kind of Bashan, that are in the mountain of Samaria, which oppress the poor, which crush the needy, which say to their masters, bring, let us drink. The kind of Bashan, strange construction in the Hebrew. Kind is an old English term for cow. But here it's in the feminine. So you can draw, come to your own conclusions there. The cows of Bashan. It, most commentators suspect this is alluding to spoiled women of luxury. The Hebrew parod is the feminine plural of para, the cow. These women oppress the poor by making excessive demands on their husbands. Some also suggest that it might imply homosexuality among the rulers. That the feminine twist on this thing isn't referring to women, it's referring to homosexual leaders. There's some commentators, the exegetical specialists that uh, suggest that may be what's implied here. 
Bashan was part of the northern kingdom. It was east of Jordan, stretched east to southeast for 75 miles. Famous for fabulous pastures, uh, well-fed fat cattle, well-watered mountains, which rise more than 5,000 feet to protect the tableland from the desert. That's the Golan Heights and all of that. Reuben and Gad and later the half-tribe Manasseh asked for that territory and, and Gilead because it was so ideal for raising cattle. So it became a controversy of its own there in the, in the book of uh, uh, Joshua. The Lord God hath sworn by His holiness that, lo, the day shall come upon you that He will take you away with hooks and your posterity with fish hooks. If you've, you've probably, if you've been to the London Museum or some of these museums where they have the old uh, engravings, you see the ancient tribes carrying their captives by hooks, uh, chains them through the nose, literally leading them by the nose. That phrase goes back to that kind of practice, uh, by a hook through the nose, widely used all through the scripture. And ye shall go out at the breaches, every cow that at that which is before her, and ye shall cast them into the palace, saith the Lord. Breaches in Hebrew is paratzim, a break in the wall, and there's a word play going on with cows, the parot, the cows, and so forth. And uh, uh, in Joshua 6, the breaches allow the holy judges in and out. And there's similar language in Joshua Amos by the Holy Spirit. It's, it's, it's very suggestive here. And the ceremonies will cease. At Bethel, Abraham pitched his tent between Bethel and Ai, built an altar, the altered life, if I can call it that, and called upon the name of Yotivave. And that's where Jacob dreamed and gave it its name and part of Samuel's early circuit. And it's now the site of Jeroboam's two altars to idols of all things. So Amos is using sarcasm here. In Gilgal, it was the first Israelite camp to be in Joshua 4, set up 12 stones and all that, base of operations during the conquest in Joshua, up to Joshua 10. Samuel judged the nation from there. Saul affirmed as king there. Gilgal is important. It's unlikely that Jeroboam first would have tried to unify his country by getting the people to abandon the worship of Yodhiv, entirely. He just added his own um, uh, idolatry mixed in with it to make it saleable. The worshipers, worshipers of Bethel consider themselves tied to Yodhiv by the covenant. That's sort of like putting in God we trust on our money and then ignoring it, right? Many of the Israelite kings have names compounded a compounded form of Yodhiv. Yoram, Yehoram, Yehu, Yehoaz, Yehoahash, Zechariah, Pekahiah, Hosea. These are all names that have the name of God buried in them. Many of the Israelites fail to understand the finer distinction that the author of the kings and the prophet Hosea rightly regarded the worship of these calves as idolatry. That was clear to the prophets and so forth and the kings, maybe not to the common people. No, says Amos, you have severed yourselves from the covenant because you do not keep its provisions. Come to Bethel and transgress. He's being sarcastic. At Gilgal, multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifice every morning and your tithes after three years. Transgress means to break a covenant. It's easier to donate, attend, and bow than to search our hearts. Form over substance is what he's saying. Misplaced zeal is what Romans 10 all talks about. Sarcasm explains this whole passage. They're zealous but unbiblical cults they're following. And offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven, and proclaim and publish the free offerings for this like, liketh you, O ye children of Israel, saith the Lord God. It may surprise you to know that there were offerings that were supposed to have leaven. And the leaven, thanksgiving with leaven. Leaven accompanied the sacrifice of thanksgiving offerings. That's in Leviticus 7, verse 13, by the way. For as the offerer's acknowledgement of his own personal unworthiness. It's the only place... That plus the Feast of First Fruits, excuse me, the Feast of Shavuot, which has uh, leavened bread representing the, giving it its Gentile flavor, which is the Feast of Pentecost and all of that. But the Thanksgiving offering is the only place where people were in a, in, in a right state before God. Here we have irony after Elijah's taunt to the priests of Baal, very in, in parallel to that. So he's speaking here now to the non-listening the non Israel. Seven punishments, famine, drought, blight, locust, plague, war, complete destruction. The partitioning phrase, still you have not returned to me, declares Yodivave, and he does that seven times. In Leviticus and Deuteronomy 28, it's all through there. But war, in the form of a sword, often directed by the Lord through those passages. War and plagues were promised as punishments for not keeping the covenant. Leviticus 26 is one of your major passages here, and Deuteronomy 28. That's exactly what he, God is saying. He's going to be good for his word here. I also have given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and want of bread in all your places, yet ye have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Cleanness of teeth. In other words, famine, crop failures. 
Your teeth are clean because there's nothing to eat, is the idea. See? Strange term, but that's very descriptive. And emergent global famine is currently being acknowledged by many international um, uh, authorities, as you're probably well aware. And also I've withhold the rain from you, where you when there were yet three months to the harvest. And I caused it to rain upon one city and caused it not to rain upon another city. One piece was rained upon, the piece where on it rained not withered. The withholding rain three months before harvest, that's called a disaster. Not only is it disastrous, but he also made it clear that God was doing it on purpose by letting it some win and some lose. Deliberate. To serve as a God-sent warning. Interesting concept. A century earlier, Elijah had pronounced no rain on the northern kingdom for three and a half years, in 1 Kings 17. That happened to be mentioned by both Jesus in Luke 4 and by James in James 5. And it also is an identifying capability of, of the two witnesses in Revelation 11. So I encourage you to check that all out. So two or three cities wandered into one city to drink water, but they were not satisfied, yet ye have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. In other words, they're so desperate, they're going city to city just for some water. They're desperate, but they still haven't heeded all this as a warning. I've smitten you with blasting and mildew. When your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increased and the palm of them devoured them, yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. With blasting and mildew. The crops are blasted by the scorching east wind from the desert. In California, we call those Santa Anas, right? And the mildew was from the excessive drought, not, uh, not from moisture. And the palmer worm, of course, is a very, very heavy... Uh, uh, form of uh, cutting off insect that you remember from Joel chapter 1, one of the most voracious form of locusts, in fact, in that, uh, that passage. The plagues of De Deuteronomy 28, the Goshen of verse 8, are now reversed, if you will. And so, and there's a parallel here perhaps to America. I'll let you conclude that on your own. But let's take it personal. Let's set aside America for a minute. Are there events in your own life? through which God is taking away material necessities f to focus you on the spiritualities. Be alert, be alert to that. God may be doing that in some of our lives because these things can apply to us personally. Are there events in our lives through which God is taking away material necessities to focus on the spiritualities? Pray about it. Every one of us is different. I have sent among you the pestilence after the manner of Egypt. Your young men have I slain with the sword. I have taken away your horses. I have made the stink of your camps to come up unto your nostrils. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Boy, that's graphic enough, isn't it? I have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and ye were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. That's the repeating refrain here, all the way through. And of course, Sodom and Gomorrah, it's used here as a manner, not for, you know, uh, I mean, not manner, but thoroughness. They're not necessarily destroyed by hailstones of fire and all that, but the thoroughness of it. Sodom and Gomorrah, the, the analogy here isn't the fire. It, that's it. has a fire plant plucked out of the fire. It's that they were destroyed and never returned, never came back. As a fire plant plucked out of the fire. A piece of firewood and blades cannot survive unless someone yanks it out. And Zechariah applies this phrase to the rescue of Judah from the Babylonian captivity, which, of course, they were. There are a lot of successive defeats. The, the Syrians under Hazael, Jeroboam, Jehu, Jehoaz. These victories gave Jeroboam the second uh, to save Israel during uh, uh, God gave Jeroboam the second during Amos's day. So those were um, victories God gave Jeroboam the second. Those are that's the good news. Various disasters of limited scope were sent in the hopes of bringing repentance. They didn't work, so he got the ultimate disaster. The Syrians wiped him out. God is not fooled by for, feigned piety. He will deal personally with this nation which was too rich, too preoccupied, and too callous to listen to his word. That's the message of Amos. Is there a parallel? That's up to you to figure out. Therefore, thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, because I will do this unto thee. Prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. The Assyrians swooped down and took the entire northern kingdom captive, distributed them throughout their empire, thus ending their corporate existence as a nation. Wow. Prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. That's a heavy sentence. Not all of them were taken captive, some were slain. Prepare to meet thy God. You know, that, that admonition applies to you and me. 
We don't know what tomorrow brings. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Are you prepared to meet God? Every day that He tarries gives us another day to repair our report cards. Are you going to stand before Him? Every one of us are going to stand before Him. Are, we going to, are you going to stand alone? Are you going to stand before God in your own righteousness? If so, you're in for a rude surprise. See, I'm not worried about standing before God. I'm a mess. You don't want to know what mess I'm in. Very few mistakes I've missed. I've done them all. But I'm not worried about that because Christ is going to stand in my place. I know that. Do you know that? Is Christ going to stand in your place at that judgment, the bema seat of Christ? If you're saved, you'll be there. Great. But how are you going to fare that report card review? That's, we might call that the final exam. I'm going to see this. It's time for all of us to cram for our finals here, right? Are you going to stand alone or are you going to have Christ as your advocate, your defense counsel? Boy, I sure, that's my choice. For, I love this, this is a great wrap up here. For lo, he that formeth the mountains and createth the wind and declareth unto man what is his thought that maketh the morning darkness and treadeth upon the high places of the earth. The Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. You know, he's not only an incredible creator, formed the mountains, created the wind. He declares to man his thoughts. This is not an impersonal force, a first cause or some other idiom. No, no. This is a God who gives us his thoughts, his words. Maketh the morning darkness, treadeth in the high places of the earth. Wow. He's omnipotent, he's omniscient, and he's omnipresent. He's more powerful than anything, he's present everywhere, and he knows everything. Secret sin on the earth will be an open scandal in heaven. You've got a secret sin that nobody knows about? <laughs> You're in for a rude surprise. A secret sin here will be an open scandal in heaven. Boy, confess it, get it behind you, get it covered. Here in, to Amos, they will not return him, so he will come to them in a terrifying historical theophany, so inexorable that no Israelite can avoid it. That's chapter 9 is going to be all about that. And it's so awesome that none can mistake it. Not in the sanctuary, but in history. Not in covenant making, but in judgment. The Lord of hosts, leader of the Israeli army, that, used, that term is used 282 times in the Old Testament. Hosts mean armies, by the way. The God of battle, Elohim. By the way, did you know that that's a plural noun in Hebrew? Elohim is plural. Always used as a singular, but it's plural. Did you know in Hebrew a plural is always three? Three or more. Not two or more. There's a, two or more is a dual. There's a singular, a dual, and a plural, which is three or more. Elohim is three or more. Don't tell me the Trinity is in the Old Testament. It's in the very first verse. Barashi, bara, Elohim, and so forth. Yeah, okay. And just as long as it's the Israel Defense Force, everybody wonders, what's this, you know, um, uh, Tzal Hal uh, acronym? Tzafawot Haganah Le Yisrael. The host of defense for Israel is what you'll see, the three letters on a jacket, whatever. Okay, well, we've taken a quick look at the first two sermons. For next time, I'd like you to read two chapters, five and six. That's going to be the final sermon of Amos. And it deals with Israel's future. These previous two sermons, chapter 3 was Israel present then, and chapter 4 was Israel's past from his point of view. Third sermon is going to be Israel's future, chapter 5 and chapter 6. And let's stand for a closing word of prayer.